Hi, welcome back. In this session, I'd like to talk about GE. GE's had a horrific two weeks, Let, leave that alone, a horrific two years where it's seen its market cap plummet. And the big question facing GE investors or potential investors is what do we do now? After all, this is a company that is an icon for US industry, a mainstay of markets for so long. It is difficult to visualize a world without GE, but we might have to start doing it. In fact, I'm giving away a little bit of the story I'm going to tell you that underlies my valuation of GE by the title of my presentation, The Bataan Death March. It's difficult to think of uplifting stories that come out of a Bataan Death March. It's difficult to tell an uplifting story about GE, but I think you might be surprised at how this story ends. So let's go back and look at the start of that. The lead in here is a very simple one. It was only about 20 years ago, less than 20 years ago, in 2001, that GE was the largest market cap stock in the world. Seems like eons ago, but wasn't that long ago, with a market cap greater than 500 billion. It was the quintessential conglomerate, with its feet in multiple businesses, 25 to 30 businesses, pretty much every business you could think of, and pretty much every geography. It was the ultimate octopus company. Octopus in what sense? It had its uh, it had its arms in every business and every region of the world. And it seemed to have found the secret to being able to insulate itself against market shocks by being in every business. In fact, it was the poster child for conglomeration. Those days are far behind us. In the last two years especially, but leading in from 2008, the company's had a difficult time. It's, it's had a new CEO just come in, replacing a Jack Flannery, who was a CEO only for two years, where it saw its market cap plummet. But today, the question we're facing is, where does GE go from where it is today? So I think to understand where GE can go, we have to go back in time to GE's history. And GE's history is very much corporate history in the U.S. GE can trace its beginnings back to Thomas Edison and his invention of the light bulb in 1878. Well, Thomas Edison started a company called Edison Electric that he combined with two other com companies in 1892 to create General Electric. That was 1892. It's been a publicly traded company since a 126-year life. But for much of its life, GE was a manufacturing company. It changed the way Americans lived by supplying appliances. It was part of that revolution that changed the American home, but it stayed primarily a manufacturing company. It was in 1980 that the new GE was born when a person called Jack Welch became CEO of GE. He changed GE for better or for worse. And what we see in GE today is really the company that Jack created. So to see how GE has evolved over time, let's look at how the markets have viewed GE by looking at the market capitalization of GE over time. Here, I've gone back to 1950. I know GE's been around since 1892, but this captures much of GE's interesting history. And you can see for much of the period, even since 1950, GE is an okay, a solid company, but it's not a spectacular company. Then you get to the 1980s and the 1990s, and you see GE take off. In fact, I've broken down the tenure of six CEOs who've run GE since 1950. It's not a company that changes CEOs quickly. And I've, co and I've computed on an average basis how much stock prices rose on an annual basis with each CEO. Here again, you can see the basis for Jack Welch's alleged stock prices at GE increased more than 20% a year between 1980 and 2000. Thus was born the legend. Now let's look at what drove that market cap rise. This is the operating history of GE, where you can see revenues, operating income, and net income. And I've also computed operating and net margins over time. So if you look at revenues again, you can see revenues grow gradually for much of the period, then take off during the 1980s and 90s, and then peak in 2008 before going into a decline. 2008 clearly had an effect on the company. Again, looking at the actual numbers, if you look at the, the CEO preceded Jack Welch, Reginald Jones, he was a legend too. He might not have been as ambitious as Jack was in, in terms of you know, delivering growth or getting into new businesses, but he was the, he was the CEO who, who started GE on a growth path. GE, Jack Welch kept GE on that growth path, path, but what he created that caused the market cap jump, jump was the doubling in margins to 20% plus. So how did he do it? To understand what, what Welch created in GE, it's best to look at how GE has changed as a company. As I mentioned earlier, 
GE for much of its life was a manufacturing company until 1980. It was in 1980 that Jack Welch came in and somewhere in the mid 80s, he, he, and he brought GE into a business that essentially became its mainstay, which was a GE finance, which is a financing business. What attracted Jack Welch to the financing business, and he's been pretty open about it, was the fact that it looked like easy money as he described it. We didn't have to invest as much capital as you do in manufacturing companies and you got hefty margins. And increasingly, starting in the 80s, building into the 90s, G made, G, Jack Welch made GE a financing company first and a manufacturing company second. You can see that even in the period that I'm looking at here from 1998 on, where GE capital revenues are a dominant part of the company. 35-40% of the revenues come from GE. And in fact, in 2008, that was what led to the, to the fall of GE as a company. By making itself a financial service company, Jack Welch gained the benefit of growth in the, in, the in the first decade of this century. But in 2008, when the financial service business imploded, took down GE with it. And in fact, you can see since 2008, GE has been trying very hard to reduce its exposure to the financing business. And it's become a much smaller part of GE. But in a sense, you can see GE's business mix changed during the 1980s and 90s, allowed it to grow fast and have high margins, but it also created the reasons for why GE has had trouble in the last decade. So GE coming to 2018, if you break it down, is in eight different businesses. It's in the power, it's three of these businesses are energy related, power, renewable energy and oil and gas, Aviation, healthcare, and transportation are three other businesses. And there are three, two businesses which are fading but hanging in there. One is lighting, GE bulbs, light bulbs, etc. And GE was, in fact, this is the business GE was born in, and GE Capital, which is now much lower, a much smaller slice of the pie than it used to be, but it's still there. If I take a closer look at these businesses, because these businesses are not all created equal in terms of growth and profitability, here's what I see. I see three businesses, the energy businesses, which are at best businesses where GE is running in place. In what way? Well, they're low margin businesses where GE earns a return on capital, even in its best days, roughly equal to the cost of capital. In fact, if you look at the 2017 operating income, all three businesses underperformed. They generated returns lower than the cost of capital. But even if you said, well, 2017, that might not be a good year, oil prices were down. Even if I use normalized margins, average margins, over the last five years, power and renewable energy have returns on capital higher than the cost of capital, but not by much. Oil and gas remains a bad business, no matter how I slice it, looking across the last five years. Well, there are three good businesses that GE is in, and this is the good news, the aviation business, the healthcare, and the transportation business. They're good businesses in terms of profitability. They're delivering high margins and high returns on capital, but they're low growth businesses. So the energy businesses have growth and no margins. The aviation, healthcare, and transportation business have margins and no growth. And you have the two declining businesses, lighting and capital. And capital is a drag on the entire company. It's more money loser than money gainer. And you can see it in the numbers. So that's the setup. Let's see what the paths forward are. To understand where GE can go in the future, I'm going to take a perspective I've taken before. Take a look at where it is in the life cycle. And I think, you know, you can very easily jump to the conclusion. It's 126 years old, so therefore it must be an aging company. And you'd be right. But I think it goes beyond age. This is a company where all of its businesses are mature or at, at best and declining at worst. So basically you have a combination of eight businesses, none of which except for perhaps renewable energy can be called growth businesses. It's a collection of aging businesses and the sheer math then makes GE into a mature to declining company. So any path I have to devise for GE has to work with that reality. I have to be a realist. So here's the first path. You're in eight different businesses. Maybe the path to success here is to break them up, sell off the businesses and look to see whether the sum of the pieces will be greater than, the, than what you're getting in the market today. Now, this might seem like an obvious uh, an obvious way for, for GE to go, but, but let's step back. For this to actually create value for investors, three things have to be true. First is, 
The businesses have to be separable. In other words, if businesses are interlocked and the connections across business, it becomes much more difficult to break up a company. Breaking up Disney into its individual parts would be a nightmare. How would you separate theme parks from the movie business? So the businesses have to be separable. On this ground, on this count, I think GE has an advantage. Its businesses are in fact separable businesses. You need, except for GE Capital, and GE Capital is, as I said, a nightmare. The second is willing buyers. You need people to to be out there who are willing to pay a price higher than what you would make if you ran these businesses on your own. Remember, it's not the selling off of a business that creates value. It's whether what you get, the divestiture price exceeds what you what you would have got as value by running the business. You need willing buyers. Why might buyers pay higher prices? Because you're in a glamorous business. You're in the social media business, the artificial intelligence business. It could be because they see synergies between what you do and what they do. It could also be because they can change the management. They don't think you are a well-managed company. I don't think any of those applies to GE's businesses. None of these businesses are glamour businesses. None of these businesses are viewed as particularly badly managed. And it's very difficult to see how potential synergies can, can justify much of a premium. And overhanging all of this is a desperation factor, which is if you try to sell these businesses, there aren't that many buyers. You're not going to be able to play them off against each other. The third possibility is there's so much corporate waste that after you break the companies up, you can eliminate the corporate GNA. I wish this were the case for G, but I don't think it is. If you look at their collective corporate expenses, the expenses that they allocated was about $3.8 billion. I'm not counting about $4.1 billion that they had was one-time restructuring charges. Of the 3.8 billion, 2.2 billion was just set aside for pensions. Those contractual obligations are not going to go away if GE breaks itself up. So I don't see much room for cutting costs. I don't see many willing buyers who are going to pay a premium over what you could get by running these businesses. I don't think, so, but I do think these businesses are separable. So if I were to look at whether this this possibility, this, this pathway will work hard. I have to price these businesses. And what are you talking about? If you've um, you know, read you know, much of what I've written about price and value, or even you know, seen some of my you know, webcasts on price versus value, you know that pricing a business is very different from valuing a business. Valuing a business, you look at cash flows, growth and risk, and you might use a discounted cash flow valuation. To price a business, you look at what other people are paying for similar businesses. If you break up your company, you're trying to sell to people today, in today's marketplace, you should be pricing the business. So I took GE and I decided to price each piece. So to do this, I adopted a very simplistic approach. I started with the EBITDA of each business. And this took a little doing because I took their normalized margins over the last five years. I came up with an operating income. I took the, G, the corporate expenses and I moved it to each business based on revenues. And then I added the DNA that, um, that GE reported for each business. I got an EBITDA for each business. I also looked up what the typical multiple of EBITDA that companies in this business trade for. And I actually use many of the numbers on my own website where I report this on average by, for different businesses. So I took each business, I took the EBITDA, I multiplied by that pure group, EV to EBITDA, I came up with an estimated value. And you can see my the sum of my estimated values for my business, including the capital business, about two hundred and twelve billion. Now, before you get too excited, remember you have to add cash, you have to subtract out debt, and and minority interest. And I come up with the pricing for the company if it's broken up, of about one hundred and two billion, one hundred and three billion, which divided by the number of shares would give me a value of almost twelve dollars per share, which is significantly higher than the stock price today. But before you get too excited though, I think it is unlikely, very unlikely that GE can get these estimated prices for two reasons. One is, as I said, each of these businesses, there aren't that many potential buyers. Second, GE's would be desperate. They'd be doing a fire sale. And even in the last couple of weeks, they've been trying to sell a portion of their holding in the oil business in the form of Baker, in the form of a Baker Hughes holding. And they've had to accept a discount on even the market price of these company, of these uh, of these shares. So I think if they go down this route, they will get a discount. And I don't think that this is a route that's going to be easy for GE today. So here's the second choice. Continue to run these businesses, but retrench. Make yourself a smaller company. What will that mean? Kind of extract yourself or reduce your exposure to your bad businesses. In this case, that's obviously capital. 
and perhaps a lesser presence in the power business and kind of go where your strengths lie. Your strengths lie in those mature businesses, aviation, healthcare and transportation. We have high margins and high returns. You might not have much growth, so you've got to be a realist. You're looking at low growth, high margin businesses. So maybe become a smaller, less ambitious company. So what I've done is basically valued each business now instead of pricing it. And this requires, again, some simplistic assumptions. I use their normalized operating income to come up with the return on capital of each business. And then I use the revenue growth over the last five years as the expected growth over the next five years. I don't think any of these businesses, perhaps excluding the green energy business, is going to have that much growth left. But And if I bring in those assumptions, the value that I get for, um, for GE shares after netting out you know, debt and minority interest and removing the option stake, is about $10.90. Not as high as I got to the pricing, but I think this is a more realistic valuation because this does not require desperation sales. There are two big challenges that GE will face if it decides to go down this route. The one is the company has a lot of debt. You can see that. Much of that debt comes from GE Capital, but there's nothing they can do about it. That debt overhangs the company. In fact, in the last few weeks, the the bond markets have turned negative on GE. Their credit spreads are widened. So they've got to get through that debt, bring that debt down, and that's not going to be easy to do. I'm not going to claim it's easy, but it might require extricating themselves from some of their businesses, selling the businesses where they can find willing buyers and pay down the debt. The second is GE Capital is a nightmare. If you look at both the pricing and the valuation, you'll notice that the value that I attach to G Capital's assets, the operations, is well below the debt that is due on GE Capital. GE Capital at this stage is a drag on the company. In fact, it's reducing my value by about 25 to 26 billion. And that actually is my expectation of what it will cost GE to extricate itself from the GE Capital business. This is not going to be a question of how much money can you make from GE Capital. It's how little money can you lose while you extricate yourself. But I feel that this is that, that there's a realistic chance that GE can pull this off. There's a third choice that I hope they will not try to go down, which is to reincarnate themselves. What a growth company. Well, companies try to do this all the time, right? They go and do acquisitions, enter new businesses. This will be devastating. This would be the Bataan death march because all you will then see are headlines of GE buying a company and headlines a couple of years later of GE writing off that money. This will be a long slide to nothing. And I hope the company does not do it. For the moment, Larry, you know, Larry Culpers, their new CEO, seems to have no grandiose plans, but that might be because he's in crisis. Who knows how we will feel a year from now? We reward CEOs who are you know, turnaround companies. And I think it's, it's unfortunate because it encourages CEOs to go out and gamble the company. I, I, as I said, I'm praying this will not happen because this is a role model that I hope Larry Culp follows. It's not that of Steve, the visionary. And you know what Steve I'm talking about? It's Larry, the liquidator. This is a company badly in need of an unambitious, non-visionary CEO with his attention or her attention paid to kind of making the company smaller and less ambitious over time. So looking back at what we've learned from GE, because this is, you know, let's face it, GE is perhaps the most written about company in business case history, partly because it's been around so long and partly because it's done so many different things. In the 1980s and 90s, of course, this was the case that Harvard Business School would have used to illustrate why conglomeration was good and how a visionary CEO can change a company. But here are the lessons I get by looking at GE's full history. First, conglomeration was, is, and always will be a bad idea. I've never understood the allure of a conglomerate. Only a corporate strategist would think that combining companies in different businesses, often by acquiring them by paying huge premiums, is somehow going to create value. When you and I can go out and create our own customized, diversified companies or portfolios without paying that, that premium. So... I would love to tell you that GE's demise will end the conglomeration trend, but unfortunately in, bus in business, no lesson stays learned. We always unlearn it and relearn it. So 30 or 40 years from now, don't be surprised to see it make a comeback. Second, complexity as a cost. I say only half jokingly in my valuation classes that my vision of valuation hell 
is to be stuck valuing G day after day after day, every day for the rest of eternity, perhaps on a Dell computer. Um, now, it, it, GE was the ultimate complex company. Complex because it was in many businesses in many countries. And the cherry on the top of this complexity case, of course, uh, cake was, of course, GE Capital. You embed one of the largest banks in the world in the middle of one of the largest multinational multi-business companies, you've created an incredibly complex mess. But here's why GE did it. In its good days, GE actually allowed, used complexity as a shield. Shield against what? It covered up a lot of sloppy acquisition practices and bad deals because it was so complex. People had no idea where the money was coming from or it was going. But here's the problem with complexity. There will be bad times. And when those bad times happen, that same complexity that helped you will come back to hurt you. One reason GE is in as much trouble as it is now because there are lots of investors who've given up on GE. They don't know what what's inside the company. And I think that while it might be too late for GE, I'd hope the lesson from this is learned by other companies that are now building up their own complex messes. I mean, Asia is full of these large companies which are being, which are being built as complex messes. Remember, today that complexity might serve you. Tomorrow it'll come back to hurt you. Third, easy money always comes with a catch. And I think that that's a lesson that you can learn by looking back at the financial service foray that GE made. Let's look back. Jack Welch entered the financial service business because it looked like easy money. And it was easy in the following sense. It did not require the capital that you needed to be in the manufacturing business. And you could grow really fast and scale up really quickly. That's the easy part. But financial services have a long, long history. And over their history, that's what we found. In periods of plenty, and there are those, financial service firms look really good. Everybody pays off their loans, or most people pay off their loans. You make well above what you charge the interest rate. You look fat, rich, and happy. But through history, those periods of plenty are always interspersed with bouts of incredible pain. When economies go into recessions, financial markets go into crisis, people stop paying their loans. And that's why banks have to build a buffer for those bad times. There will be bad times. So as Jack Welch made G increasingly a bet in the financial service business because it looked good, what he seemed not to have considered was there will be bad times as there were in 2008. And what made G such a great company, and this is the irony, might be the source of its destruction. And finally, I am always queasy about CEOs of you to saviors. Jack Welch was a master CEO. He was a man with vision and a drive. He could motivate people. He changed the company. He could see things coming around the corner. I mean, if you were building a prototype leader, it'd look a lot like Jack Welch, but he's a human. And like all humans, he had his weaknesses. He had an ego. He was an imperial CEO. He made his board of directors a rubber stamp for what he did. And left unchecked, he made mistakes that might bring GE down. So as we enter a new era of tech companies with founder CEOs who viewed as visionaries and geniuses, I hope we remember that lesson, that left unchecked, human beings will overreach, no matter how smart and how visionary they are. It's not a bad thing to be slowed down by having people ask you why. And I think that there's a lesson from G. I hope that's a lesson we take away. So here's the bottom line though. I value companies. I love uplifting stories. I love valuing Amazon. Huge uplifting story, right? But remember, in my September 2018 valuation of Amazon, with that uplifting story, I came up with a high value, but the price was even higher. It was a bad investment. G is not an uplifting story. This is a depressing story where a company at best is going to stay where it is and at worst is going to shrink over time. But even with that negative story, the bad story, and the value that comes out of it, it's a good investment because the price is even lower. We don't, we don't or should not be buying good companies because they're good companies. Investing is about finding good investments. And for me, GE is not a great company. It's a pretty boring and negative story, but it's a good investment. And at, at today's price, I think the market has overreacted to some of the bad news that GE has had. And I'm buying now, could I be wrong? Absolutely. Especially if Larry Cook develops grandiose megalomaniac schemes. I hope he doesn't. 
and he doesn't sound like the guy. He doesn't seem like a guy who could do this, but I've been surprised before. So I'm buying and I will hold. You know, and perhaps in a year or two or three years, I can come back with a good ending to my pretty boring story. But that's all I have to say. Thank you very much for listening.